Hello everyone, how's it going? Welcome to today's video. Uh, today we're going to be talking about Palantir, trading under the ticker symbol PLTR on the NASDAQ. So Palantir has been a company that has attracted a lot of like retail traders for the simple reason that when it went public, you know, the stock market was in a very different position and um, people were expecting that it can go from $30 to $40 to like $50 to $100 and so on. So the hopes and the hypes were infinite at the time. And seeing how seemingly like, you know, advanced the, the Palantir's business model is or what they do is like a bit cryptic for people who are not into programming, as well as the fact that the CEO is an eccentric guy who says things that very few people, especially in the Silicon Valley, say. Um, all these have attracted a special crowd around this company. Plus the fact that opposite to many other companies that we have seen uh, in this, like on this channel, it also has some serious backing from people who have a true track record. For example, Peter Thiel, one of the founders or one of the people who have co-financed the startup of Palantir, is also the one behind PayPal. So for these reasons and many more, Palantir was a very popular stock amongst like retail traders and arguably amongst institutionals as well. But we're going to be talking about institutionals a bit more in just a second. With that being said, nothing that's very good will last super long, right? So the recent price action of Palantir has been disappointing, to say the least. A lot of people were hoping that it can you know, hold around the $13 or at least the $10 psychological level. Uh, it didn't. And then things kind of went on from there. I wouldn't say that it's necessarily went downhill, but, you know, with everything down, uh, Palantir also went along with the wave. So right now, Palantir is attempting to come back. And it has shown that at least for the short term or the foreseeable future, there is a sort of bottom that Palantir is unlikely to go below of. With that being said, nothing is ever guaranteed in the market like this. So I remember before when I was covering uh, Paysafe and SoFi, there were times when I was like, hey, you know what, the stock seems to have bottom because it has slided for so long and, um, you know, hopefully it's going to go back up. This has yet to happen, right? Um, we're going to talk about SoFi in just a, in probably a next video, but for Palantir, I would say that for now, it seems like shareholders and people who want to buy or sell Palantir shares, they're not really willing to sell it lower from, from the current point. So this is why I would say that they will try to recover, but they're going to lead, they're going to need catalysts, not only from themselves, but from the like the entire sector as well. We're also going to talk about some other um, some other factors in just a bit, so definitely stay tuned. So in the recent article, Alex Carp suggested that there will be hard times ahead. Um, Plenty will likely not going to be spared from all this, but he said that you know strong companies are going to survive and thrive from it. Now. In that, he kind of also, he didn't say that, okay, but I kind of added as a um, as what he implicates. He implicates that Palantir is one of those stronger companies that can weather this, uh, you know, super storm. So because of that, arguably, this might offer some optimism for people who want to buy Palantir or people who have already bought Palantir, like myself. So with that being said, you know, overall, things are looking stable at the moment. Stable with heavy selling pressure that exists still. It is just what it is. It's how the market is at the moment. And um, overall, the market trends in this new environment with the QT, so quantitative tightening, tends to go for safety. And they want to go to like things that will guarantee them a yield, that also guarantee like their initial investment capital. So this is more than fine. And to be honest, it's something that most of us should try to do, right? When you're in a stock market, the first thing that you're trying to do 
is to make sure that whatever you've put in is not going to be um, is not going to be lost before thinking about how much money you can make from the volatilities. For example, at the moment there are some bonds like corporate bonds that will end in like in the twenty eighties, offering seven to eight percent of yearly um, yearly yields. I mean, is this going to be better or worse compared to Palantir? This is a question that we can that we can ask, especially when those are the companies that are very unlikely of going south, at least in the foreseeable future. So this is why, like for a lot of investors, much like the way that the capital just flew in like there's no tomorrow back in 2020 into the EV sector and then spread over to like other tech stocks and growth stocks. Uh, just like how it benefited Palantir and others back in 2020, 2021, now this phenomenon is going the other way around because the the interest rate is like four to five percent, almost guaranteed. So this is this is why like they don't have a problem um, just flying back to things that they see as more stable, as more predictable, and things that more importantly that they know what they are. For example. If I buy in bonds of Pepsi, or if I buy in bonds of Coca Cola, or if I buy if I buy in uh, bonds of like Walt Disney and so on, I know what this company is. I know how they make money. I know what their business model is. Palantir. I mean, Palantir deals in big data, right? They arrange big data. They try to spot trends. They try to um, optimize how businesses operate by spotting those trends and identifying what are some of the causalities. But ultimately, they've never specifically mentioned what is their business model, despite the fact that they already have many big clients and that they've been operating for many years. Because before of going IPO, Plenty has been a company doing data processing uh, for the, many of those same clients for many years. So th this is why I think that for Palantir, at some point, there will need to be more clarity coming from the management, stating what is their added value? What do they offer the clients? Um, I have seen many of the trailers and of their presentations regarding the Gotham or the Foundry. I have to say it's never super clear, maybe because it's too it's too uh, technical, but see, that's the, that's the problem. Like I understand that ultimately their clients tend to be sophisticated, uh, large cap companies, but it's also possible that other companies are better at communications. And then there will be a problem at the end of the line when it comes to choosing which company you want to, you want to work with. So, this might be something that Palantir needs to work a little bit more about, but I have to say, um, regardless of like the technical mumbo jumbos, um, I still kind of under like I still like not not understand, but I still like to watch their uh, their presentations because they're very professionally made, they're crisp, they're minimalistic. Um, so yeah, that that's my opinion about um, about like. Palantir and their business model, as well as their public image. So their clientele, like I've said before, tends to be bigger companies, corporations, uh, government agencies, essentially entities with deep pockets as far as a company is concerned. So of course, big companies can also go bust, governments can go bankrupt or default on their bonds. But so far, this is not happening. And as long as the current status quo remains, we can say that Palantir is doing business with people who are guaranteed to pay you. So this is already a good thing. The other thing is they do have, in my opinion, privileged relationships with different government departments. And because of this, when it comes to choosing which company they want to work with, which, you know, private sector partner they want to work with, they're likely, they're more likely of going to Palantir. Um, what else? So the shareholders currently, and th this is something that I mentioned previously, like, um, about institutions versus retail. 
Palantir has around 35-40% to 40 of institutional shareholders. And I have to say, this is a little bit low for a company that claims to do what it, what it does. Meaning, high sensitive, like highly sensitive uh, data work for government agencies as well as big companies. Normally, we should have seen higher institutional participation. But we're not seeing this. So, the, essentially, there are two possibilities. Number one, the retail is more enthused about Palantir than the institutions. So, this is number one. And number two, maybe it's not a question of how enthused they are. It's just that they think that the price is too high. And if they're not participating en masse right now, does it mean that the price is still too high? So those are the things that uh, we have to definitely have to check out as time goes on. Now, in my opinion, the price of Palantir is going to keep going up and possibly go back to $10 within the next few months if there's no additional negative catalysts coming from the market. So for example, if the interest rate goes to like 10%, then yeah, we're, we're going to be in a different picture. Or if the recession worsens significantly from where it is now. For example, remember last time we talked about FedEx and how FedEx has the whole market spooked because if they have a hard time, it pretty much means that the real economy is having a very hard time. Even though Palantir doesn't you know, sell burgers or uh, transport parcels, but they kind of work with many of those companies. And if those companies are not doing well, ultimately their budgets for many different projects are going to shrink, right? And indirectly, this is going to affect Palantir as well. It's a bit like, you know, when you work in a law firm or you work in an accounting firm, from a very surface level, you are protected from the rest of the real economy. Because in order for your company to start laying off people, a lot of companies need to go bust before, you know, before uh, before this firm starts to lay off people. Well, this has happened before, so this is why it's not completely immune to it. However, it's going to be relatively, very relatively uh, immune from the direct impacts of the economy going into recession. Speaking of recession, I would say that we have to assume that we are already in a de facto recession environment. Maybe the government statistics are going to keep dragging this issue on for another few quarters or, yeah, a few quarters. But I don't think that um, there is much secret to it. The way that people look after their budgets, the way that a lot of institutions, companies are tightening their money the way that, I don't know if where you live, you would see like shops that have been around for decades suddenly shutting down. Or if you see like in your local supermarkets, there's a lot less products. All these are pretty obvious signs that something is not going right in the economy. So we definitely have to assume that Palantir now evolves in a recession-ish uh, environment. So this is why, going forward, we do have to be careful about whether we want to buy it now and how much we want to buy it for. And of course, how many shares of Palantir we're willing to buy. Um, personally, I can say this much. I would say that Palantir is definitely a company with a lot of potentials and with true value. Um, nobody will know for sure where the absolute bottom is. And frankly, I'm not sure that we need this information to make a decision about whether we want to buy Palantir now. I myself have about... Well, hold on. Let, let, me, let me check. I have 0.75%. So 0.8% of my portfolio's capital into Palantir. And I do plan to increase my exposure in Palantir over the next 24 months. So I'm going to dollar average in. And um, 
like wherever wherever the wind will bring Palantir to, I'm pretty sure that I would be in a good spot, given that even though we're not in the deepest part of the recession yet, usually the stock market, it tends to reflect what our current expectation of the future is. So given that this current um, market correction or recession, however you want to call it, has been around for like 10 plus years, like people have been expecting for a long time that something is going to go seriously wrong within the stock market over many years. So now that it finally happens, it's possible that the expectation of what's what's going to be uh, what's going to happen could be already there. You see, you see what I'm saying? Like, it's possible that a recession, when it actually happens, will show that the economy will go worse than where it is now as of October or, you know, end of September uh, 2022. But the expectation of how bad it could go, it might have already been reflected. Of course, this is... This is not very likely that it has completely been reflected. So this is why I would say that still assume that it can go, you know, more south by another 30 to 50 percent. I'm ready for that. Um, and if you want to buy Palantir, you should be as well. So just one final thing. Well, two final things for which kind of investors I would recommend Palantir for if you believe that Palantir is going to be a major player in the data, like the big data sector in the future. If you believe that, then you should definitely buy Palantir. And also, if you believe that Palantir is unlikely to go much lower than where it is now, which which is something that I tend to believe in, um, I would say that, you know, go for it. And Personally, I would say that if Palantir goes as low as $5, this is where a lot of people would stop selling it, you know, and I am, I am prepared. I'm not predicting, but I'm prepared for Palantir to go as low as $5 some point in within the next 12 to 24 months. It doesn't mean that it's going to happen. It just means that I have to prepare for this uh, possible scenario. And number two, how much should you buy Palantir? Like, sorry, not how much should you buy, but how much Palantir should you put in your portfolio? I would say that an exposure of three to five percent is a good place to be with uh, with Palantir. But of course, I I would also highly recommend to buy your Palantir shares gradually over a period of twelve to twenty four months. Now, given the current market environment, I believe that the equity market is in a vast phase of correction, especially when it comes to tech and growth type equities. The financial market has been living and breathing thanks to the continuous creation of new capital with different waves of quantitative easings, which will have consequences on the price of assets as well as their yields. With the interest rates kept relatively low over the years and the increase of amount of capital in circulation, this will keep putting significant pressure on the profit that we can expect the investment products across the board. And this, by the way, is a reality that may shift in the years to come if the interest rate of core infrastructures within our globally financialized system increases. It's useful to remember that the market doesn't represent the real economy, and of course, the real economy doesn't always reflect in the stock performance, since the name of the game here is ultimately called supply and demand, which depends on a whole bunch of factors that go way beyond our own control. If we think about it, this is like saying, if your neighborhood house that is put up for sale is only allowing those who actually want to live inside to buy it, Versus if you allow every single type of buyer with different intent or reasons to buy or to sell it. So obviously, there will be a significant difference in the price of this asset for those two scenarios. The market currently works more like the second option. And assuming that it would only reflect the fundamentals of the underlying economy would correspond to the first option. There are a few elements that are considered to be the reasons. The first one is the significant increase of amount of money printed by the central banks around the world, which is then distributed to the banks, 
with the expectation that they will be loaned to businesses. Normally, that's a good thing, but with a lack of opportunities in the real economy, the significant portion of that money actually went back to the financial system to buy up the price of existing assets. Now that the QEs have been wrapping up or ended around the world, I think that this drive behind asset price may no longer be as relevant as it is right now for the future. It is now compensated by the arrival of capital from one region to another and from one sector to another even within the same jurisdiction. With the increase of tensions around the world, capital is always looking for a safe haven to park their money into, not just for a place to grow the nominal value, but with a currency that tends to keep its purchasing power as well. The third factor is the creation or the birth of artificial bubbles either maintained by the market trends built up over the years or out of necessity. Capital needs to find a place to stay. Some good examples of this would include the EV sector in the 2020 and the oil and gas securities when there are tensions around the world. Either way, when it comes to the price trends of the market, the degree of uncertainty is a key drive behind the price fluctuations and that is likely going to increase as we go on from there. When company announce that they are going to enter or exit different markets, or that they will be trading on different platforms and exchanges, this can all have significant ramifications on the price of this asset. Some of the considerations to have when operating in this context include having a clear view of what is going on, especially regarding the cash flow and the capital flow, and avoid certain potential pitfalls. One of these is to be careful with short positions. Inherently, short positions are riskier than long positions as the downside of long positions is limited, whereas the short positions can lose you as much money as the stock price may reach, which is infinite. On top of that, we're now seeing a new phenomenon with short squeezes involving a group of retail traders propping the stock price up forcing short sellers to recover their positions. Sometimes the attempt will not succeed, but sometimes they end up in very spectacular success. Something else to consider is to treat tech stocks with care. To start ask questions when the price of a security skyrockets without real fundamentals. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't be touching it with a 10-foot pole, but it does mean that there should be a difference between the decision of long-term holding and short-term trading. Either way, a rule of thumb is that each position should be structured in a way so that their individual performances will never affect the portfolio's stability. Thank you for watching. If you like my content, please like, comment, and subscribe to my channel.